Well, good morning. Today is Tuesday, April the 14th, and this is macroeconomics on the downslide, or as we used to say, what? We're down to the short rows, right? You know what the short rows are? Remember that? Is that what we used to say? Not y'all. Right. Listen. Or the short rows. Corn. Suppose you had a piece of property like that that you were going to farm. And you had to make furrows up and down so you could plant your seed in rows. How would you, how would you plow it? You take the longest stretch you can and you just start running down here and back here and down here and down here and here and down here. And then when you're getting close to the end, what are you doing? Oh, the, short short roads. Roads. the short roads. So down to the short roads means you're getting towards the end of something. Another phrase that in the American lexicon will soon disappear because we have so few farmers anymore. Yeah. What's on your mind? Anybody? Five, seven, ten, twelve of us here today. Twelve out of fifty-four. You're either really slow to catch on and drop this course, or you're very determined. I don't know which. <laughs> desperate? You know, okay, desperate works. Personally, for me, I just have nothing better to do. That works for me. <laughs> and knowing you as I do, I'm sure that's quite true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to... to do. So the, ball the marginal benefit point. of this class is better than the marginal benefit of spending time in my house doing nothing. Ah, okay. Reading a book. I read a little this morning. A book without pictures? <laughs> I drive the state, if you will. Ah, certainly. <clears throat> so, anyone here go to Spring Arts Festival this weekend? Uh, yeah. Nobody? What is that? This is a, every spring, down on one block off of Main Street, from University Avenue, eight blocks up, you have vendors with various and sundry arts and crafts and, and neat stuff, really beautiful stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then there's a ch section a little further over for the children. My grand, two of my grandsons were in town with us this weekend. We took them over there and got their faces painted. <laughs> they, had, they had a Lego set up for the kids. <laughs> that was just amazing. I mean, tons of Legos, and these kids, you know, this tall, they're all sitting around there, and they got a big ramp that you can fix your little Lego thing, go over there and put it down the ramp. And they were there for an hour and a half, you know? You've never seen anybody get so absorbed in something. Yeah. Kind of neat. Legos are amazing. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. In 21, they're still awesome. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and then prior to that, we had gone down to the vet veterinary school at the University of Florida. They had an open house. They had some... Uh, Agility dogs performing for us, where they run around through the tunnels and over the hoops. And yeah. They were neat. They were supposed to have had a canine dem demonstration from Gainesville Police Department, but it was canceled. Yeah. They had a had a horse on a treadmill. Yeah. And we got to watch that for a while. And yeah. If you've never been close to horses, that's pretty pretty yeah. neat. You know, the kids were just like, wow. Yeah. So it was a good weekend. Then we drove to Orlando to take the kids back to their parents down there. They were down there for a conference. And we went, you, have you been to the outlet mall down there with all yeah, the outlet yeah. stores? Oh, yeah. What a zoo. Oh, yeah. That is, the place is so packed. Mm -hmm. And I sat there, you know, we sat down and had an ice cream cone and I, they're just watching people. Yeah. yeah. Our society is in trouble. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've seen the videos on YouTube about people from Walmart, people yeah. at Walmart. Have yeah. you watched those before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're really, you know, bored, mm. that'll entertain you. Mm. This is not too dissimilar, you know, that this is American society today. Yeah. What I think is funny is watching what people think is acceptable to leave the house and, like, what they're wearing. No kidding. <laughs> no yeah. kidding. Do you want to see something uh, quite SSAL? Um, Pleasurable to do it on Black Friday. On Black Friday? Yeah. Oh, I can imagine. Oh, yeah. I couldn't take it. 
I really couldn't, man. I'd, I'd, have to, I'd cry and go home. <laughs> you should try working the Starbucks in the mall on Black Friday. Uh, really? Mm. Hellacious. You did mm. cry and go home. <laughs> <laughs> you know what a hooker is? You know what a hooker is, right? Yeah. Intimately word for a prostitute. <laughs> so, say again? Intimately familiar. It's what? Intimately familiar. Intimately familiar. Thank you for sharing. Um, I don't know what the dollar value is anymore, but there were there were yes, some see. women at the outlet mall that looked like ten dollar hookers, <laughs> and I had been not attractive, ones, but was but showing so much cleavage, etc. It was simply frightening. Yeah. No, you're right. No sense of what's appropriate to wear outside. Well, even like the younger kids too. Like I've seen little girls wearing stuff that look like I, twenty dollar hookers. Been, yeah, okay. if I had been their age and I tried to leave the house like that, I would. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And and, and the, the crying shame of it to me is that's your future. That's your social security. <laughs> no. I look at the positives. Yeah. Just tell me the positives. Yeah. They're going to make a lot of money as hookers, or? No, 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 no. <laughs> Not for them, for me. Uh, I go to Walmart and I look around, and I think about my job prospects and how I'll do in life, and I say to myself, I'll be fine. You are correct. There's not a lot of competition. <laughs> look around this classroom. These were the people who finished high school, got into college, and what? Well over 50% of them are gone from this course. They're your competition. They don't, you ain't got much competition. <laughs> And ask any business owner in America what he wants most in, in, a, in an employee. What do you suppose it is? We're, our work ethic. ethic. A work ethic. He said that the, the, yeah. from the beginning. Exactly. Right. If you've got a strong work, that work ethic, a little bit of common sense, and a little bit of intellectual skill, you can become very valuable because you are a rare commodity. Mm. It doesn't mean it'll come to you. You have to go find it. You have to work at it. But. Mm. That's the work ethic part, yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, I often wonder, had I had more ambition, how, how I would be today. Yeah. But I don't have that much ambition. Yeah. I just started teaching and loved it. So. Yeah. Here I am, starving to death professor. <laughs> Not quite starving, but you know. Don't let me get morose on you. What else is on your mind? Nick? Um, did you hear about the thirty twenty five percent increase in people wanting to travel and the twenty five percentage to go across the sea and travel for it because the dollar is worth more. Yeah. Because the dollar is so valuable now, so so strong against other foreign currencies like the euro that, that uh, the demand for travel abroad is increasing markedly mm -hmm. and indeed I've been telling my wife that not this year but next year yeah. we're going to take maybe a couple of weeks and go to Europe. You know, well, what's, uh, a place I'm sorry, say again. What place to visit? Oh, um, as a child, Monaco. when my father was in service, huh? Monaco. Well, for me, I, we lived in in southern Germany and Austria, Bavaria. I'm going there now. And then when I was stationed there in the army, I, I was down close to that area. Mm -hmm. So I want very much to take her through the Bavarian area of Germany, Austria, maybe over into Czechoslovakia. Maybe take a river cruise for a few days. And then my other goal is to take her to England and tour some of the old castles, et cetera, up there. I can trace my lineage back to a castle in, in England. The size of the castle, I'd like to go see that. But someday, go whenever you get the chance. Don't wait till you're my age. I could, really, quite easily. That's a really interesting yeah. experience. Yeah. I, did, I did that when I was younger, and it was both the coolest and scariest thing at the same time because you're on this bullet train, but you're still in your car, mm -hmm. and you're going underneath the English Channel. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's amazing. That's pretty cool. Exactly. And once you get to Europe, mm -hmm. the mainland, mm -hmm. it's very small. 
Yeah. It's not huge and sprawled out like the United States. You know, a day's trip will take you most of the way of anywhere you want to go. And you can go anywhere. Fifteen American dollars. I'm sorry. Yeah. You can get plane tickets for like fifteen American dollars, and you're like from one country to like neighboring countries. Plane tickets or train tickets? Plane. Plane. Mm -hmm. oh. And there's trains to go everywhere. The yeah. trains go everywhere. And they're generally running on time, yeah. clean, well maintained. Yeah. Yeah. Totally different experience. Hmm. And the people are really like helpful yeah. too. That was always my experience over there. People were very, very kind. Mm -hmm. I, I went like two Not summers fresh. ago. Mm -hmm. I went like two summers ago for like two or three weeks. Where? Um, we started off like I went, and my dad dropped me off with my cousins in Paris, mm -hmm. and then we took trains like all the way to like Athens. Mm -hmm. A lot of fun. We went through all the south of. Like some like parts of South France, mm -hmm. Monaco, mm -hmm. South yeah. Italy, yeah, to Paris. Yeah, I mean to Greece. Trip. Yeah. And I understand things are pretty cheap in Greece today. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I was there last summer actually. It was it was cheap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I was in Rhodos, but it was because this, since this island is pretty like expensive, mm -hmm. but it was still cheap compared to like Sweden. Mm -hmm. Right. Here? Sweden, where I'm, where I'm from, like I'm, I went there and I went to a trip to Rodos, and I went to Holland that summer too. So it was pretty fun. I mean, I had a great time. <laughs> it's yeah. some of the most beautiful country in the world. Speaking of beautiful countries, I'm going to be taking the fall semester off and just traveling. Mm -hmm. What would be a good country that you would recommend that's cheap, um, completely different from America, and I would learn more than anything else? That's a hard, that's a hard question. That's an incredibly <laughs> difficult question. <laughs> and it's very subjective. Sure it is. Mm. I would I would want to sit down and quiz you about what you would want to get out of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it depends what you want to see. More. Yeah, yeah like you want yeah. culture? Do you want like art or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Kind of culture. It would be nice. There are there are for example there there are arrangements you can make to arrive in a country and have a local resident mm -hmm. who will put you up and guide you around on tours mm -hmm. one on one. Yeah. I think some of that would be phenomenal if you could get the right person. Yeah. So to me, you've got, if you're going in the fall, you need to start today and Definitely. locate those contacts, those mm -hmm. resources, go into all the travel sites, et cetera. Rick Steves, everybody familiar with no. him? Tr tremendous travel information, just everywhere you can imagine. He's got a TV show, everything. Let's start there and, and figure out where you want to go and make those contacts right now as soon as you can. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, when you travel, I personally don't like to be on a rigid schedule day by day. Yeah, I no. could get there and maybe I'm going to do this on this day and five days later i got to be over there. And in the meantime, let's just see what we find. Mm -hmm. yeah, I heard somewhere, I forgot where it was, but he said the funnest thing that you can ever do in another country is just go there and get lost. Yes. Mm -hmm. I heard a couple describing they rented a car in France mm -hmm. and just went down every little back road they could find and yeah. said they had a ball. <laughs> Yeah. There's a really cool book by Ralph Potts called Vagabonding. Vagabonding. Yeah. That's cool. And it talks about traveling and just, you know, having no itinerary, just going there, meeting the locals, figuring everything out for yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you won't really get the most out of an experience of traveling if you have, you know, specific uh, itineraries and mm -hmm. to-do lists while you're there. Yeah. Just seeing different sites and never really immersing yourself in the right. culture. Yeah. Yeah. You're on such a rigid schedule, your opportunity costs are rather, yeah, rather steep. When we were in France, um, my aunt had a very rigid schedule set up mm -hmm. for us, and mm -hmm. I think the funnest memories that I had was when we like deviated off of that, and we ended up getting lost somewhere mm -hmm. for hours mm -hmm. and hours. Yeah. It was just amazing. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some countries you don't want to get lost in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Good. Well, let us... Uh, spend a few minutes on economics because I've really only one topic I particularly want to look at today and that's kind of a review of the Reagan supply side approach to the economy and then when we meet again on Thursday that'll be your day to raise any questions or topics you want to to revisit or if you run across anything in the materials that we have not talked about at all I'll be glad to chat about those okay so kind of uh, maybe in review. If we look at the 70s, the usual word that comes to mind is stagflation. There are fairly 
chronically sick economy with escalating rates of unemployment, accompanied by the OPEC embargo in 73 and rising prices, inflation. You, you want to revisit our discussion on stagflation with all the different supply and demand curves rising. So through the 70s, it's kind of almost insidious the way inflation starts eating away at your lifestyle. Because if you get a 2 or 3% raise and prices go up by 4%, you sense you're not quite as well off. But it's kind of like taking a frog, putting him in a pot of water, cold water, and turning the heat up. He's not uncomfortable for a long time. Mm -hmm. And by the time he realizes the water's pretty damn hot, he's just about horrible and he's about dead. Mm. In inflation kind of does that to us too. You know, you get your paycheck, you go out and you well, know, gas is a little more expensive or groceries are a little more expensive or, well, the landlord raised the rent by about $10 a month. And the next thing, it's two or three or four years later and you're saying, I can't afford to do some of the things I used to do. And this creeping inflation beginning in 73, Nobody noticed it a whole lot. We adjusted to it. But by 79, it's gotten up over 12%. We're starting to get pretty worried. At the same time, um, in 79, we, uh, we had the Iran hostage affair. Are you familiar with that? Basically, the Iranian people kind of rebelled against their ruler, the Shah, whom we had supported. Mm -hmm kicked him out and took over the American embassy and took several Americans, and I forget the head count, as hostage and refused to release them. We, Jimmy Carter was president. He attempted to send in a, a military force secretly to rescue them, and that mission failed, killed some people. And so there's this angst among America that overseas we're not in good shape, and domestically our economy is we're being slowly boiled like frogs. And what are we going to do? So by the time Carter comes up for re-election in 1980, there's a, a very strong sense of we don't like the way things are going, economically or internationally. And so Carter runs against Ronald Reagan. Now, Ronald Reagan, a, a very well-known, but not top of the ra listing, uh, Hollywood actor. Made many what they call B films. Mm. You know what B meant? Great. Hmm? Like B great. Yeah, kind of second level. You know, here's the big headline film today, and here's the other film that you can watch too. Okay, there's Ronald Reagan. He did a TV show where he always wore his cowboy hat, so people knew him. But if you look at Ronald Reagan's life, he was raised in the 20s and 30s. He went to college, and he studied not acting, but in fact, economics, political science. So he was raised with a belief in the classical system of how the economy operates, that government generally does more harm than good, its role should be minimized, and that the economy does what? Self-corrects. It self-corrects. It'll periodically fall into a slump, but it'll self-correct back out. So well, isn't his family really, they, they are like the closest thing to royalty in America? You mean after he was president? Under the day before or after? I wouldn't say that. I guess maybe as president, he was he was just very well loved by a great many Americans. It's probably the Kennedys. Kennedys, same thing. Well, they're kind of like American royalty, I guess. I'm sorry. They were kind of like American royalty. They were as close as we would allow Americans to get to royalty. Yeah. yeah. In fact, our term for the Kennedy time was the the Camelot era. Okay. Um, Reagan is along the way, become, gets active in politics, but recognize his background. As an actor in the 1940s, and particularly the 1950s after World War II, what was the biggest ex existential threat to America, at least in most Americans' eyes? Cuban Missile Crisis. Communism. The Cold War. Communism and the Cold War. Yeah. And so there was this huge scare throughout this country of communists. Yeah. And everybody was suspected of being a communist if you did anything yeah. slightly un-American. Yeah. 
Okay? God forbid you took an American flag out and burned it. They, you, you'd have gotten beat up real bad. Okay? And so the next thing you know, you have people looking for communists, the big witch hunt for who's a communist, who's a secret communist. We call them pinkos, you know? pinko communists. In this search for these communists, um, and his name just jumped out of my mind, Senator Joe, help me out guys, find it on there. A Senator Communist Witch Hunt. McCarthyism? Thank you. Joseph McCarthy, Senator, I believe from Wisconsin. He launches a campaign by the United States Senate to try to identify communists in America and starts investigating people, many of them very innocent. And one of the industries they particularly targeted as they, they thought this was really a lot of communists in them were the actors in Hollywood. Yeah. Because what's going on with Hollywood, Hollywood movies even today? They're very cutting edge and frequently very, very controversial. Mm -hmm. Well, in this process, they began to blacklist actors and actresses. Mm -hmm. We think you're a communist, you're blacklisted, you can't work anymore in, mm -hmm. in Hollywood. And Reagan is an actor when he sees this going on, and he's very much a believer in communism as our biggest threat. So he grows up very conservatively and eventually campaigns, gets into the, the political life, and is elected governor of California, where he is you know, very well thought of, does very well. So in 1980, he decides it's time for him to pursue his quest for the presidency. In doing that, um, remember we have presidential primaries. What are primaries, the primary elections? So you um, elect a candidate within a party to run for the presidency? Good. The Republicans will have several candidates. They will debate. And then each state will hold their primary elections and nominate which candidate is going to represent the Republican Party and which one's going to represent the Democratic Party. So everybody's running against Carter and the Democrat. Well, Reagan comes into it doing very well, but with a, a serious contender named George H.W. Bush. Yeah. They go to the Republican convention where they're going to have that person nominated. Now, Reagan has laid out his plan. We will loosely call it Reaganomics recognizing that it also has very strong supply side elements to it, supply side economics. And as we see this, uh, I'm going to put five of them up for now, Reagan's plan is sort of controversial. And in fact, his biggest opponent for the Republican nomination, George Bush, looks at that economic plan and says, this is all voodoo economics. Yeah. What would that mean, voodoo economics? Like, with her? Yeah. What voodoo is, like, you don't know if it works. Yeah, voodoo is magic. Yeah. And probably not very true anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he's saying, basically, this is a pipe dream. He's selling a pro program here that is just absolutely ridiculous. It'll never work. So, what are the elements of Reagan's plan? First element is, let's have major tax cuts for individuals. A little tax history. From through the 50s up till 1964, the very richest people in America, and I've by today's standards, probably people making a million dollars a year or more. On any money above that million dollars, they paid a tax of 90% income tax. That's called their marginal tax rate. The tax rate on the last dollars that you earned, 90%. Now the first million you paid lower taxes on. But once you hit this cap, your tax rate jumped on every extra dollar to 90%. In 1964, we cut that to 70%. <clears throat> well, what else was going on in 1964 in this country? Vietnam. Vietnam. We were gearing up for Vietnam. We went into Vietnam with massive government spending. Yeah. 
which created a lot of jobs for a lot of guys that didn't want them. <laughs> Take your senior trip to Vietnam, okay? <laughs> but this cut in tax rates, at the same time the economy was already growing, brought in more money. But by the time we get to 1980 with Reagan, 81, when he takes office, he wants to come in and reduce the maximum rate to 50% on the very wealthiest Americans. And his argument goes back to what we put on the board last class called the Laffer Curve. Basically, if you cut tax rates on everybody, including the rich, mm -hmm. what will happen? They'll make more money. You'll generate such a stimulus to the economy mm -hmm. that you'll actually have more people making money, a bigger tax base, mm -hmm. and therefore you'll collect more money. And people will pay more taxes. Too. And the total tax paid will be more because more of us will be paying it, but each of us will be paying a smaller percentage of our income. So you get a boost to the economy and a boost to you and I individually. And that was the attraction of this whole supply side thing. Also, for the Laffer curve, wasn't it that um, people would avoid taxes less? Yes. Unless they were. A combination of you go ahead and declare your taxes and not take all the loopholes or cheat, but also you would be willing to work above the table as opposed to below, and you'd be willing to work more hours, take on jobs that maybe in the past you didn't, didn't want. Right. Yeah. So it's supposed to stimulate output, employment, everybody was going to live happily ever after. Incidentally, by about 86, Reagan also proposed dropping that to 28%, which we did. And then now today, I think the max rate is somewhere around 36. It's come back up some. 39? 39, yeah, 39 sounds good. Not being in that income bracket, I haven't been too concerned. <laughs> So the first part of Reaganomics is we're going to have these huge tax cuts and it's going to actually bring in more tax revenue for the government. And if we can do it with business or with individuals, we can also do it with individuals. I mean with businesses. We give businesses tax cuts, particularly in the form of depreciation. What is depreciation? Um, losing value. It's the loss in value of an asset. Over time. Over time or over use. If you buy a truck and it's expected to last five years, if you did it on a straight line, you'd say that truck loses value of 20% each year. And at the end of the fifth year, it's not worth anything. Well, let's say the truck costs $10,000. So you get $2,000 of depreciation every year for your business. What does that do for you? Can write that off in the next you write it off. You deduct it from your income and therefore reduce your taxes. So depreciation is a good thing for businesses. What if I told you instead of depreciating your truck over five years, I'd let you depreciate it in three years? Mm -hmm. Then you would have more to write off each year. You bet. You'd have a $3,333 deduction instead of a $2,000 deduction. Mm -hmm. That would reduce your taxable income, reduce your taxes, and by the way, what happens to that truck after you've had it for three years? It has no value on your books. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with it? Still use it. Mm -hmm. Probably sell it. If business is doing well, mm -hmm. why not buy a newer truck every three years instead of every five years? Mm -hmm. And this is frequently what happens. Assets get depreciated down to zero and they get sold on the used market, the secondary market. So if you were in the market for a used truck, what did that do for you? Made it There's a whole lot of used trucks out there. And so businesses that couldn't afford new trucks could afford fairly new used trucks. And so they'd buy those. What do you suppose that did for the automotive industry, the cars and truck manufacturers? They lowered it. Life is good. People are buying trucks and cars frequently. Mm -hmm. And so, again, you get this stimulus to the economy through this accelerated depreciation. Mm -hmm. The next thing Reagan suggested was we got too much regulation on businesses. We got so many squirrely regulations that are costing businesses that we don't need. Suppose the regulation said that when you drove your truck from Miami to Seattle mm -hmm. to deliver stuff, semi-truck, that you had to drive it back empty. Um, Would that make sense? No, no of course not. <clears throat> but we had interstate commerce rules and laws that were just about that extreme. We, we refused to let airlines compete with each other. 
we would say, oh, you get the route from New York City to Miami, but you get the route from, I don't know, St. Louis to San Diego. And, mm -hmm. and so we were trying to control things that way. Mm -hmm. And Reagan is saying, we need re less regulation and more competition. Mm -hmm. That's This will bring down the costs of businesses. Mm -hmm. And with lower costs, what will happen? Lower prices. Lower prices. And with lower prices, what will happen? Increase. Increase sales. And with increased sales, what will happen? Mm -hmm. More jobs. Hire more people. You see what deregulation and the way of reducing costs can do? It takes that supply curve. Remember that supply curve? that shifted up here with oil prices, mm -hmm. what does deregulation do? Lowers the cost of production. It shifts it back. You see what he's trying to do? Mm -hmm. So it's easy to say that supply-side economics was voodoo, mm -hmm. but in some ways, it made really good sense. Mm -hmm. All right. What else did Reagan want to do? He wanted to cut a lot of social programs, social spending. <clears throat> what do you think I'm talking about here? Welfare. Welfare. Mm -hmm. Welfare and many other government programs designed to help people in need. He thought we had gone way over the board on that, starting back with the Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s and the war on poverty. Mm -hmm. He said, you're trying to fix poverty by giving people money, and that's not going to do it. Mm -hmm. What happens when you give people money? No. They have no incentive to work, mm -hmm. and you're getting that money from the taxpayer who is working and mm -hmm. punishing him for working. Mm -hmm. So you got your incentives totally screwed up. Mm -hmm. So let's stop rewarding people for not working. Maybe that's a little simplistic. Mm -hmm. Certainly there are people out there that would take money and not work and be happy. Mm -hmm. But are there other people out there that really would rather have the job than the unemployment or the welfare? Yeah. So again, a little simplistic, but easy sell to the to the people. When you're running for office, you get a lot of support for that kind of argument that there's a bunch of lazy people in our society. What do we call them? Mm -hmm. Parasites. Mm -hmm. A lot of parasites out there, and none of us should be paying for them because they're too lazy to work. Mm -hmm. Well, you can stir up a lot of strong feeling with that. And then finally, we should increase defense spending. And so just a word or two about that. We sent our first, let me just speak to Vietnam just for a minute. A little history. <clears throat> Vietnam. Indochina. During World War II in Asia, the Japanese invaded many lands, including China, Taiwan, and areas down in South Asia, including what was then called Indochina, which became Vietnam. In fighting the Japanese, one of the big Vietnamese leaders was a fellow by the name of Ho Chi Minh. real fighter and in fact we sent troops and, and supplies to help him he was our ally fighting the japanese mm -hmm. now at the time the japanese took over indochina it was a colony of france france had built a colony there had established the french as the upper class they owned the rubber plantations and such as that <laughs> so the japanese came in took over indochina we assisted Ho Chi Minh and his crowd fighting the Japanese in the war ends. Following the end of the war, what happens to Indochina? Well, Ho Chi Minh said, we want our independence. And the United States looked at its ally France and said, no, you're a French colony. Mm. With that word, Ho Chi Minh said, the United States, you are no longer our friend. I will go find allies where I can. How about Communist China? How about the, the Soviet, you know, the USSR? We will take them on as friends and get them to help us regain our independence. What we did was 
we divided Vietnam or Ho Chi, uh, Indochina into North Vietnam and South Vietnam, and the communists controlled this area, and we supported the folks down there, and the French were there everywhere. The French took over control again. So from 1945 for nine years, the Vietnamese fought the French for their independence. 1954, in the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the French finally lost and left Vietnam. The United States, 1954, what was our biggest existential threat? Communism. Communism. And so we saw uh, Vietnam getting ready to go communist. And if Vietnam went communist, we were fairly certain that then we'd fall Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and then maybe move on over to India and Southwest Asia. So beginning in 1954, the United States began to send advisors to Vietnam to advise the Vietnamese army on how to resist communism. Mm. This goes on for another 11 years. Mm. It's not going well. So in 1965, we sent the first American troops, complete units, to Vietnam. We stay there and fight communism until 1975, 10 more years. Ho Chi Minh wins. He reunites North and South Vietnam into what we know today as Vietnam. The war's over. 75. What was the state of the American military by 1975? And you have to look at that in the context of what was the state of American society as well. Everyone like, was against the army. Beginning in the 60s, we had the drug, sex, and rock and roll revolution. Mm -hmm. Remember that, the hippies? Mm -hmm. If you look at the Democratic Convention in 1968 in Chicago, you saw a lot of young college-age kids out there protesting against the war in Vietnam, mm -hmm. and the police out there beating the hell out of them. <laughs> Okay. By 1972, we're still there, but we're trying, we're, you know, mo, much of the country is saying, get us the hell out of Vietnam. All we're doing is seeing American lives lost, mm. and we're not accomplishing any, mm. any, anything. In the mid-late 60s, I can remember sitting uh, with my parents, we'd have TV trays to eat supper and watch TV. And what we got to see over supper was American bodies being put on helicopters and airlifted out. Right. American soldiers lay in there bleeding and being bandaged yeah. right there in your living room every night. Mm -hmm. So there begins to grow this resentment of the war and we don't seem to be achieving anything. Mm -hmm. So by 1975 with, with Nixon and establishing ties with China, we start withdrawing. By 75, we're out. By 72, 73, we're starting to draw down our forces. But by 1975 and by 1979, clearly, the American military is exhausted. The American public hated the military. The Vietnam veterans would return home and they would be spit upon. They'd have bags of unpleasant things thrown at them, okay? They were called baby killers, etc. Mm -hmm. These are young men who were drafted against their own will mm -hmm. and forced to go to war. Mm -hmm. A very unfortunate time. The American military, in the meantime, was really reduced in size because we didn't want to be in Vietnam anymore. But over the period from 1965 until 1980, the American military deteriorated. Its equipment was worn and worn out. It was not replacing it with new equipment. I was stationed in Europe. We couldn't get ammunition to go train with. We couldn't get money to put fuel in our tanks to drive down the roads. We were just sitting there waiting. And this bad basic joke among us was if the Russians invade, yeah. just get your Russian flag out and stand on the side of the road. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was just about that funny. Well, another joke was, what's the fastest vehicle in the battalion? Well, it's that big old tank retriever. Yeah. Okay, when the Russians invade, I'm getting on the tank retriever and I'm hauling ass to the English Channel. Yeah. Okay? It was, it was sad. In addition, in the military at the time, we had major drug problems and we had major race problems. 
which continued to deteriorate our fighting ability. I had many occasions where my soldiers were messed up by drugs. We had an occasion one night, I had guard duty. We had, I don't know if you remember, in 1972, uh, they struck the Olympics and killed some Israeli athletes. And that was kind of the beginnings for us of the Arab uprising. So in, the, in fear of terrorists striking some of our ammunition storage areas or our motor pools, we had armed guards walking around our tank motor pool where all our vehicles were, armed with submachine guns and ammo. And so I'm on duty and about two o'clock in the morning I hear machine gun fire. Brrrm. So I got five or six of my soldiers, because we were all armed, and we went down to the motor pool, and you could see the, the muzzle blast going up in the air. So we creeped up to the, to the fence around the motor pool, stayed low, tried to see what's going on. I said, hold your fire. Nobody shoots unless they shoot at us. Let's see what this is. And we waited, and here comes a soldier walking down the middle of the motor pool, with a gun. And he'd stop every once in a while and brrr, put a new clip in it. Brrr. And my guys are ready, man. We're going to take him out. Yeah. I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. And as he came down, I thought I recognized him. And he was one of the soldiers in the company I had been in. Yeah. And I called him out by name. Uh, I said, is that you? And he, who's that? I said, this is Lieutenant Strickland. Hey, Lieutenant, come on in. We're having a party. Mm. He was so up on drugs, he didn't know where he was. Wow. He's out there firing his weapon. That's the kind of crap that's going on. Mm. Uh, Here we go. <laughs> 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 we, had, we had a race riot where some African-American soldiers captured the battalion commander's daughter mm -hmm. and took her as hostage into the, into the post theater mm -hmm. and said, we want to negotiate better working conditions. Mm -hmm. In the military? <laughs> but that's the kind of problem. Yeah. Social upheaval, a deteriorated military, yeah. and Ronald Reagan worried to death that the Russians are going to invade any minute. Yeah. Okay? So that kind of explains why he wanted to see our defense spending upgraded, better quality, more of it, better training. 1973, we went from the draft to a volunteer army. Yeah. Okay? That had its problems, too. Yeah. But this is the setting for Reagan when he comes into office. And this is kind of his program, what he wants to do. Back to the term voodoo economics. And then, yeah, okay. George Bush says, all of this is voodoo economics. What makes it voodoo economics, George? Hmm. He said, this part right here is going to lead to huge deficits. You're not going to have the money to increase spending. The Democrats aren't going to let you cut the social spending because you don't own the Congress. He says, this stuff just isn't going to fly. And so the Republicans are holding their convention and they're debating, which one of these guys do we want to have run for the, against Carter? Yeah. And so they chose Reagan. And immediately Reagan turns around and says, for vice president, I choose George Bush. Yeah. At which time George Bush said, voodoo economics? Oh, hell no, this is good stuff. <laughs> okay? yeah. And he starts promoting it, and that's what we did. So that's kind of the you know, onslaught of, of Reagan and Reaganomics. Uh, let's present it in two other ways with a graph, because this is economics and we don't do anything without a graph. <laughs> the first one we looked at the other day, just a quick review, this is the Laffer curve. And it says basically as you raise marginal tax rates, your tax receipts follow a particular pattern. As you raise your rates, that's really good. You collect more money. That's what should happen. But then at some point, your rate of collection doesn't keep going. It starts tapering off, even with higher rates. And at some rate, 
If you get above that rate, you collect less money. So these very high, high tax rates up in here, we call the prohibitive range. Uh, another secret word for that is stupid, <laughs> because if you will simply reduce rates from this level to this level, you get all the positive attributes of supply side economics. More taxes collected, more jobs, more spending, lower tax rates, everybody lives happily ever after. This is part of Reagan's view. Mm -hmm. The other description of it, let me just draw a graph over here, is that if you are at this equilibrium over here, what's that vertical line? Long run aggregate supply. Long run aggregate supply at full employment. If in fact you are you, you are here at point A. And you can shift the aggregate supply curve. What does that yield? More employment and lower prices. More employment, For lower more employment. jobs, more incomes, lower tax rates. And everybody lives happily ever after. Mm -hmm. You could go from A to B if, in, fi in fact, we can get these supply side incentives and tax reductions implemented. And so this is, this is the easy way to explain Reaganomics, what he was attempting to do. Downside is that in attempting to do that, you wind up giving a lot of tax breaks to wealthy individuals and large businesses. What does that mean? They maybe don't the rise of capital don't spend it because they don't have a very high marginal propensity to consume. Good. They are going to have a higher marginal propensity to save. Right. And so when they pay lower tax rates, they tend to accumulate more capital. Financial and other capital. And you get back to criticism Marx always had of capitalism. Mm. The very wealthy get wealthier, and the very poor either benefit not at all or very little. Okay? But we stayed with this. We stayed with this all the way until 1992. Mm. What happened in 1992? Clinton. We elected Bill Clinton, and we modified some of this. Mm. And under Clinton, we also got more growth, and you got to give some credit to the Reagan approach initially, and Bush after him, of trying to keep these incentives in. But under Reagan, we saw large reductions in social spending, welfare rolls markedly, because we said, if you're on welfare, you get two years at a time, and not more than five years total. And so the number of people on welfare dropped back down to what it had been around the 1960s. Mm. At the same time, the economy was growing and they controlled spending, and instead of deficits, at least for two years under Clinton, we actually ran a surplus. Mm. Yeah. So by the time Clinton leaves office in 2000, we've got a healthy economy, we've got a budget surplus, mm -hmm. looking like things are back under control. We've got a very strong and healthy military. Mm. Okay. What happened after that? Mm -hmm. We had 9-11, we elected George Walker Bush, George the Lesser, if you will, mm -hmm. and what did he do? He got us into a war mm -hmm. on false pretenses, mm -hmm. and he gave us a huge tax cut. Mm -hmm. So he instituted a whole lot more spending and much lower taxes, mm -hmm. and what happened? So Deficits. That's when our deficits really took off. So he's there from 2000 until 2008. What's happened by 2008? Recession. Why did we have a recession in 2008? Uh, deregulated banking. Deregulated mm -hmm. banking was a big player. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why did we deregulate banking? To make it. Housing more affordable. Housing level. So, because it would make the banking system more competitive. Yeah. Okay. And it would allow, with that competition, more people would be able to afford homes. Mm -hmm. And so banks started making all of these loans to people that couldn't really afford the homes, mm -hmm. packaging up those mortgages and selling them. Mm -hmm. And then when people stopped being able to pay their mortgages, 
that collapsed. Well, they would charge them an introductory rate for the first two to three years. You bet. We'll give you two years at zero, oh. virtually zero interest. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then they would just kick it way, way up. And then it would go through the roof. But the, the buyers were saying, well, I'm not going to be there more than two years anyway because the prices are going up. Yeah. And in two years, I'm going to sell this house, make a tremendous profit. Yeah. And then I'll be able to buy you know, another house or whatever. Yeah. And you got into pure speculation, just like the 1929 stock market. Yeah. Who oversaw all of this? Greenspan. Greenspan and the Treasury. Okay. But Alan Greenspan, remember, chairman of the Fed for how many years? Yeah. 19. 19 years, and I'm sure you remember why. Yeah. Because Volcker only served eight. Yeah. He filled in Volcker's term and then started his own term. Mm -hmm. But Greenspan is very much of a classical, neoclassical, monetarist sort who said that regulation stymies competition and stymies growth so we should deregulate everywhere we can keep interest rates very low and he allowed that bubble to grow and burst yeah. by his own admission mm -hmm. let's go back to Reaganomics what happened about the deficits and the Laffer curve did we in fact cut tax rates and make more money no David Stockman was the budget director under Ronald Reagan. He's the guy who designed all that stuff and implemented it. He came out a few years after Reagan, well, actually a few years ago, and said it didn't work. We collected less money. The whole idea that you could drop that tax rate from here to here may be true, but in fact we didn't know where we were up here, and more likely we went from here to here. And so we collected less money continuing to spend on defense, didn't cut spending on social programs, Democrats resisted that, and we wound up with these huge deficits. Then you interface that with our political system where you have to survive every two years and there is no incentive to try to treat that deficit. And now you've laid the groundwork for some of the arguments by the Tea Party and the far right that we are fiscally irresponsible and out of control. Yeah. And then you get right back into the argument of what should we do? We have a sick economy and huge deficits. What should we do? Austerity or stimulus? Mm. And bingo, we're right back where we started this term. Yes and no. Hmm? Yes and no. Yeah. Well, well I, I tend to think of Keynes. Mm. In the long run, we're all dead. We better do something now. Mm. Mm. We don't do something now. You may not see the long run. Mm -hmm. So that kind of concludes the course as far as the formal stuff I wanted to present. Mm -hmm. Kind of a rushed wrap up, but questions, comments? Anybody, anything? Paul Bernanke. Paul Bernanke. Ben Bernanke. Ben Bernanke. Ben. He succeeded Greenspan and treated the recession. Remember, Greenspan left in what? Six. Oh, six. six. Yeah. Bernanke comes in just in time to inherit the mess. Yeah. Which, by the way, is kind of what Obama inherited. Yeah. Huge deficits that eight years prior we've been looking at surpluses. Mm -hmm. And Obama inherits also a Congress yeah. that is determined not to support him on anything. So yeah. we lose all fiscal policy. Yeah. Although Obama had a two-year window. Yeah. He got some fiscal stimulus passed. Maybe not really well done, but by most arguments, that's what's kept our economy from doing as poorly as most of the economies in Western Europe. Mm. But that's where we are today. Wasn't the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act in 97, though? Yeah. So part of it was Clinton? Yeah, I definitely got to lay some of that blame for repealing Glass-Steagall at Clinton. Nobody knew just how bad it was going to get. Mm. Um, Glass-Steagall was the act that kept commercial banks from being also investment banks. Mm. It was the reaction to the um, Great Depression, wasn't it? Was it passed in like 33? Yeah, but basically we didn't want investment banks taking depositors' money and taking risks with it. Right. Mm. But when we eliminated Glass-Steagall, a bank could do both of those with, you know, with very little oversight. That's kind of what triggered us into the financial crisis. Yeah. If you want to hear somebody talk about that, listen to Senator Elizabeth Warren. Yeah. And she's really strong on financial reform and consumer uh, product safety board, or consumer yeah. financial protection board, mm -hmm. and trying to keep the banking system from going crazy again. Yeah. So 
Oh, incidentally, what happened over the last few days in terms of presidential politics? Marco Rubio announced, Hillary mm -hmm. Clinton announced, mm -hmm. Donald Trump. Donald? He's, he's thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Who's Cruz? Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz announced, yeah. hard right conservative. Rand Paul announced, yeah. libertarian. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't think he's a Marco Rubio announced, far right conservative. Is he really a libertarian though, Rand Paul? Rand Paul? I mean, he says he is, but. Rand Paul says a lot of things. Nobody knows who he is, perhaps. <laughs> even, so. yeah. And then who else announced? Yeah. Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Oh, God, we're going to mess this. Yeah. We're going to have a battle royal for the presidency. Hillary Clinton seems the strongest so far. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think you're right. Hillary Clinton is in the strongest position right yeah. now. Yeah. She hadn't done as many things to alienate as many people as some of the folks on the far right. Mm. But it'll get ugly. And the truth will be the first victim, right? Mm. That's all right. All right. Other comments, questions, thoughts? Mm. Didn't Paul Volcker have a big effect in the Reagan Army? Yes, in that Volcker eliminated inflation or brought it down to tolerable levels, yeah. and kept it that way throughout the 1980s under Reagan, which is the reason Bill Clinton kept him on board when he was elected. So, yeah. We give credit to Volcker for defeating inflation from the 70s, and then we give tend to give Ben Bernanke, at least most of us do, give Ben Bernanke credit for keeping interest rates low through this great recession and keeping it from getting as bad as it could have been. But the division between the classical versus the Keynesian-oriented thinkers is very clear today. You know my biases, but I hope I've shown you both sides of those arguments. Other comments, questions? You have a whole list of things that will be on this exam. Yeah. Are those videos that are pending going to be posted this week? No. Yes. So they will not be tested. Only what we have said in the in classroom. Okay. Yes, sir? Most of the exam is going to come off the graphs that we end up Most of the exam is going to come off of what we have done in class. Yeah. And the book, part from the book, uh, most of the stuff from the book comes from what we have done in class. But you still want to look through those chapters. There will be some points that we never talked about, but I expect you to get from the text. Yeah. But your best preparation for this exam is the class videos and the other assigned videos, much of which is repetitious. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am? Um, we don't have a final for this class, do we? No, you just have exam three, which will be either Tuesday or Thursday, April 21st or 3rd, depending on what class you're in. Mm -hmm. There are fewer, few of us enough now that probably if you all want to come in on the 21st, you can. Looks like there'll be plenty of empty seats. Yeah. All right. I'll see you on Thursday, and you will take your questions, okay? Bye.